searching for it later. Daniel chapter 4. It's always amazing. I've been preaching for over 30 years, and it's pastoring for right almost at 30 years. And it's always amazing to me when, because I preach through books of the Bible, right? So I cannot, I cannot plan this. I cannot schedule certain sermons to happen right when you need that. But God can. And so when we turn to Daniel chapter, and I've been saying chapter 4, it's really chapter 5, I'm sorry. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1 through 12. And uh, let's get this started. Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. The handwriting on the wall, the name of this message. And we're just going to read the first uh, 12 verses this morning. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. And he was drinking wine in the presence of a thousand. And when Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines, drank from them. And they drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. And the king called aloud to bring the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. And the king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple, and have a necklace of gold around his neck, and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. And the queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. And the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, and interpretation of dreams, and explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we look into your word today, that you would help me to be clear in my mind, my expression, help us to allow your spirit to speak to us by focusing on your word, not being distracted and not being apathetic towards it. I pray that you would help us to really Allow your word to do its work, and I pray that you would be honored and glorified in all that we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to Daniel chapter 5 at a very important and ironic time. Our country has elected the next president of the United States amidst great conflict and uncertainty and all the stuff that's going on there. Both sides of the political spectrum, ever since this campaign really got going, act as if the next president holds the fate of the nation, the nation's well-being in his hands. Well, that mentality is the same one that Nebuchadnezzar had. And now we see it in Belshazzar. But it's all about the king. It's all about who's in government. That's going to decide your future and your well-being. That mentality reveals the weak faith that believers have even, and the ignorance that unbelievers have on the truth that is the theme of this great book. That God rules over the nations. And he exalts and tears down both kings and kingdoms as it fits his plans. 
When God chooses to exalt a leader in a nation, and when he decides to humble it, he will do it. He doesn't need voters. He doesn't need electoral colleges. He will do it by, and I quote Daniel 4.32, the Most High who is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Whoever he wishes. Now we may wonder sometimes why he wishes a certain leader to be president of our country throughout my lifetime. I don't mean just now, and who knows what's going to happen, but I'm not speaking just about today or just about now. The book of Daniel also reminds us of this great truth. When God judges the nation, God still watches over his saints. That's a very comforting thought to me. And isn't that what we see? We see that here in, in Daniel. We see that in the book of Esther. Don't forget that Esther lived after Daniel. She's still in the same type of captivity scenario in the sense that um, she's queen in, in Persia, which is the kingdom that takes over this land and the Israelites, etc., from Babylon. Not only, like Daniel, was she provided for, but she also, like Daniel, rose up, and her uncle rose up as well to be a great leader in that particular regime. Look at the Jews during the days of exile. 70 years. And certainly they had great struggles, but God brought them through it. They were even on the brink of extinction until in Esther's day, Esther rose up, or God rose up Esther and Mordecai to deliver them. And then their circumstances took a 180 degree turn. They went from being an edict to kill them all to then having this wonderful feast they can celebrate every year of God's deliverance. Centuries later, we see God's people under the government of Rome, living fairly comfortably until Jesus is crucified. And then about uh, 40 years later, persecution erupted then, but about 40 years later, Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans, their temple was destroyed. And yet, God has still delivered them and will deliver them. God will one day bring them to a total fulfillment of all that he had promised them. And we, as his church, will enjoy a major role in that eternal kingdom as well. And so this entire book is a powerful reminder of God's sovereign rule over all nations and his steadfast love of his people. Folks, from here to the rest of your life, it doesn't matter what's happening politically. God loves you. And yeah, that doesn't mean you won't have serious problems. I'm not saying we'll be, uh, you know, always provided for in the way we want to be. But we will endure. And our nation will endure. Um, if it doesn't, Christians in it will endure. Um, and that's what this entire book is about. Look at some reminders of that in the passages that I've lumped in one big kind of a paragraph. But his, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Another kingdom inferior to you, this is the prophecy of, again, of Babylon's destruction. Another kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And then the last verse here, uh, this, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the Holy One to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules over the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. And so with all that building up, we get to chapter 5. In chapter 5, as we come to chapter 5, it's on the heels of describing the great redemption and restoration of Nebuchadnezzar's soul and his reign and all the flourishing of it and all the prosperity of it. And we see now how quickly that glory disappears. As in God's plan, it was time for Babylon to give way to that inferior kingdom that was prophesied about in chapter 2. More specifically, chapter 2, verse 39. And so we meet Belshazzar, now reigning over Babylon as a co-regent with his father, Nabonidus. And he is repeating the same arrogance and rebellion 
that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar once manifested, which drove him to be like an animal for seven years. But the difference is, Belshazzar doesn't repent in humility like Nebuchadnezzar did. And so the once all-powerful king of Babylon with its unparalleled beauty and majesty will be taken over by the Medes and Persians. By the way, that's at the end of this chapter, but we're not covering all of it today, but you need to understand that. And it will be taken over by the Medes and Persians due, humanly speaking, to man's arrogant pride. But divinely speaking, it's the next step in God's plan. And so, the events of Daniel 5 serve as another powerful illustration of the final words of praise that Scripture records in the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, verse 37, where he said, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt the King of heaven, for all his works are true. And his ways are just, and he's able to humble those who walk in pride. Now, he said that because he was humble, right? He walked in pride. Now we see Belshazzar, his grandson, who's going to be humbled and killed because of his pride. By the end of this chapter, which is all one night, the same night, we discover the fulfillment of this handwriting on the wall, and Belshazzar is killed, and the Medes and Persians take over. But before we get there, First, we want to look at this incredible arrogance as we notice Belshazzar's self-exalting feast. His self-exalting feast, the first four verses of chapter 5, where Belshazzar has this feast, he invites all his nobles, he, they start drinking, etc., and then they, they go and bring in the golden vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had um, taken out of the temple as they ransacked Jerusalem many years before. And like chapter 4, there's a lot of trees in this chapter. There's a lot of stuff in this chapter, but you can't really get it if we don't keep our eyes in the forest. So though we're covering the first 12 verses, we're going to keep our eyes in the forest as well. And what we're going to see in this chapter is that David Daniel shows us that you can trust in self and man and live in fear, or you can trust and serve God and live in the peace that faith provides. You want to live in fear, you're not trusting God. You're trusting in man. We need to trust in God and live in the peace that faith provides. The handwriting is on the wall for Babylon, but it's not on the wall for God's people in Babylon. That's the great truth I, I really have been really being encouraged by throughout all of our own strife as a nation and uncertainty is that, you know what? No matter what happens politically, God's going to take care of his people. And it may be that we're going to suffer a lot along the way, but God's going to take care of his people. Now, as we look at this, there's a lot of trees that are kind of, uh, I don't know, stuff that you might not be interested in, but it's really important for us to understand. So we're going to look at the timing of his feast. And as we do, we're going to have to get into some historical issues because you need to understand why this event is where it is in Daniel. Because it's not chronological exactly. And why I've called Belshazzar Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, even though the scripture uses the term son or Nebuchadnezzar as his father. So the timing of this feast kind of helps us with all that. And so to properly understand this chapter, we need to wade through some important historical details. And part of the understanding of the time of the feast, we need to discuss the identity of Belshazzar as co-regent of Babylon. The identity of Belshazzar as co-regent of Babylon. Critics have long targeted this chapter as an example that scripture is inaccurate, that Daniel's inaccurate, because for a long time there was no knowledge of Bel someone named Belshazzar. The next king that, uh, well, let me just stay with my notes here. John Phillips writes, for centuries the only known reference to this king Belshazzar was the Bible. The critics had a meaty bone on which to gnaw. The problem was that for a long time, Nabonidus was the last known king of Babylon, and outside of scripture, we knew nothing about Belshazzar. So, at the end of this chapter, um, Babylon is defeated by the Mersians, uh, Persians. It's the same night of what we're starting to read. Well, that was Nabonidus <coughs> as the king. So where does this Belshazzar come from? Well, even though our faith in God's word is based on knowing that God is true, we don't need archaeology to verify that. I'm not going to stop trusting God for things that are confusing. 
and that we don't have an answer to, but in this case, God allowed man to discover facts previously buried under the sands of time that vindicate what God has said. And I'm quoting now, the discovery of the Babylonian Chronicle, so this is an archaeological find, uh, finally resolved the apparent problem. Nabonidus was an absent king who abandoned the city of Babylon and its religious festivals and left his son, Belshazzar, to rule in his place as crown prince. You heard me use the term co-regent in the introduction. This continued for five years, maybe even longer, and ancient texts have been uncovered that elevate Belshazzar to the functional role of king during the long absence of his father. So from a technical standpoint, Nabonidus was king, but he basically, he, there was all kinds of warfare going on, and he didn't think that much about the city of Babylon. He left it into the hands of his son. So his son became, for all pretense and purposes, king, even though he was really a co-regent. So that is why you get the, the two people involved here. The Chronicle also agrees with Daniel's much older account. Daniel, of course, writing way before this particular uh, Babylonian document. When it says this, On the 16th day of the month Tishri, in Nabonidus's 17th year, being that would be of his reign, Saturday, October 12, 539 B.C., if you want to be specific, the army of Cyrus entered Babylon without a battle. Of course, we're not going to go into that detail today, but that's exactly what's described in the Bible. Herodotus, another ancient historian, writes that Babylon fell during a time of festival or celebration. Now, what does all this mean to timing? Well, that's the second part, the time frame of this feast and its broader context. So we need to walk through some passages here. I need to show you some things. So in chapter 5, verse 1, Belshazzar the king is holding a great feast, right? Then you drop to towards the end of the, the chapter, you drop to the end of the chapter, and once Daniel comes and interprets the message, which is basically, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting, the King James says, or deficient, and your kingdom is divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. That's the handwriting on the wall. And then verse 30 and 31 says this, and yes, I'm, it's not up here. you just got to be following the Bible. I'm sorry I didn't tell you that already. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So the very same night that this feast ends with this Daniel coming in, interpreting the handwriting on the wall, saying your kingdom has been found wanting, and you're going to be taken over by the Medes and Persians that night. Belshazzar dies, and Persia takes over. Chronologically, however, I want you now to turn to chapter 7, verse 1. Because here we have, in effect, in chapter 5, the fall of Babylon to Persia. But what do we have in chapter 7, verse 1? In chapter 8, verse 1? In chapter 9, verse 1? Look at verse 1 of chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. So basically, we have the fall of Babylon in chapter 5, with Belshazzar being killed. But then in chapter 7, in chapter 8, and in chapter 9, Daniel gives us details about some visions he had, not anything Belshazzar had that he interpreted, that basically deal with the end times. And he's giving us this information in chapter 7, 8, and 9, which all happened during the early years of Belshazzar's reign. Chapter 7, verse 1 said it was in the first year of his reign, and he got this one vision. Chapter 8, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me. And then in chapter 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius. So you've got a reference in chapter 7 to the first year of Belshazzar's reign, a dream that Daniel had and recorded. In chapter 8, the third year of Belshazzar's reign. And then in chapter 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, who took the city and took over, um, that's the information that Daniel's going to start giving us in chapter 9, where he has another vision. Why is all this important? Well, because you've got to understand, first of all, if you're reading through Daniel and you get there, you say, what in the world? Why is this going backwards and forth? Just like a movie guy, you know? You're watching a movie and all of a sudden it's up, it's up on the screen, you know, seven years prior or something. And if you're like me and you look over and you're not sure your wife saw that, and she's always 
multitasking. But hey, we're going back seven years. And so Daniel, as he presents the fall of Babylon, immediately after describing the humbling and restoration of Nebuchadnezzar, I, I think that's the purpose. I think that's the main purpose. The contrast. Here's Nebuchadnezzar, humbled, but then repent. Here's um, Belshazzar, who is humbled, doesn't repent, and the kingdom's taken over. I think Daniel is clearly trying to make a point about his overall theme. And what's the overall theme? If you don't know it by now, you really haven't been listening. The overall theme of this book, that God exalts and takes down kingdoms and nations. And what this, and the historical record of several Babylonian kings that reign in between, that's something that I'm trying to get you to, there are kings that reign in between Nabonidus and Belshazzar. Or excuse me, them together. The kings reign between them. And so when we get to chapter 4, and chapter 5 especially, what you need to understand is that between chapter 4 and chapter 5, a lot of time has passed between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar's reign. Several kings. Um, and I didn't have write down their names, and that's not really important, but one is evil something, or evil Mordak or something like that. I always thought that was an interesting name. So that explains why when they, they don't have Daniel, you know, they got to go get Daniel, and it seems like Belshazzar doesn't even know who Daniel is. He does, but Daniel's not high anymore involved in the day-to-day -day affairs, so it seems. And the reason is, well, he didn't just go from this event in chapter 4 to now this is the next event. This isn't the next event. Daniel's getting pretty old by this point. He's much older, and although later in the chapter, of chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, uh, some statements are made that makes it evident or obvious that Belshazzar knew who he was, but for whatever reason, it appears that by the time Belshazzar came to power, Daniel's no longer actively involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the king and of the wise men. So, that's all into this timing, trying to understand the chronology and the lack of chronology that fits in here. And then secondly, uh, so this feast is at the very end of the reign of Babylon, and Daniel's a much older man. He might be at this point, uh, you know, I don't want to guess, but he's, if he went in as a teenager, he might be even in his 60s by now or older. Um, the carnal nature of this feast. The carnal nature of this feast. Verse 1, the middle, the second part of verse 1, he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousands. And we get the description of the feast. I'm not going to read all the verses right now, but number one, it was motivated by arrogant pride. Arrogant pride. The, even this expression that he held this great feast for a thousand of his nobles, kind of like what Nebuchadnezzar had done, where he invited all the all the nobles in, and you're going to worship the statue that I have built. He invites them all in, and he's drinking wine with them. One writer states that as Nero was said to have fiddled while Rome burned, so Belshazzar feasted while Babylon fell. You see, without going into all the historical details, Belshazzar and his leaders were so arrogant based on the greatness of Babylon's history and its supposed impregnable, impregnable defenses namely their mammoth walls and their military towers. They were literally holding this feast while the Medes and Persians were marching on the city. I mean, they took it over that night. They literally had the city, basically, they were marching in. They thought, Babylon thought, and Belshazzar thought, they can't get to us between our, our, our natural layout and different things and uh, the rivers and so forth and our walls. They can't get to us. And so they decided to have a party. Can you imagine having... Uh, army circling your city and you being so arrogant that you're just going to throw a party. That's what they were doing. Notice, I've already said this many times, and I'm not, so I'm not going to go back and read it, but I'll just re-emphasize this. Babylon falls 
that very night. So while they're feasting and partying, uh, the armies are surrounding them. One writer says it this way, on that final fateful night, the whole territory surrounding the city of Babylon and the related provinces have been already been conquered. Only Babylon, with its massive walls and fortifications, remained intact. Nabonidus had been defeated in battle and fled, leaving Belshazzar in charge of the remaining forces in the city of Babylon, possibly to reassert their faith in their Babylonian gods and to bolster their own courage. This feast had been ordered. And again, this expression, he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousands, basically what was probably happening, most commentaries believe, is that as a king, he was elevated. He was in an elevated like stage or whatever where the throne was at, and he's basically leading them, you know, in their drinking, in their partying, toasting, <laughs> and doing, you know, the kind of things people do. And so he's really leading them and drinking to their God. Did you notice that in verse 4? They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. He clearly does not understand or believe that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind and sets it over whomever he will. He believes, as I'm sure most leaders do, that really it's all about them. And my challenge for you is, do you believe that? Do you believe that the Most High God rules over the nations of men? Oh yes, I know we're all in church, we know the Bible teaches that, so yes, we believe it. Do you? Do you act like you believe it? Are you responding to the events and have been responding to the events that are going on in our country as if you believe that God is in control? We all comfort ourselves with that truth, but the proof is always in the pudding. So whenever anxiety comes in about anything, right, anything, we're not to be anxious for anything. So when anxiety comes in, it really shows us, at that moment at least, how weak our faith is. So again, you can trust in self, and man and live in fear, or you can trust in God and serve God and live in faith and the peace that comes with it. What a folly to trust in any man, any leader, any form of government over God. Because God will both raise up and take down nations. He provides good and bad leaders, has done it throughout history. We can look at our own country, we can look at a lot of other countries, I won't name any in particular. But, um, and yet here we are in 2020. You know what? We're living a pretty good life. We are. And we're really insulting God if we don't think we are. I've traveled as many of you have, and I, I keep thinking back to where I look at Ukraine and I'm thinking, man, those we got godly friends over there, believers that are, are having a good life. But they've been through communism, they've been through perestroika, they've been to all the more modern, current, you know, stresses where really communism is trying to take back over. There's so much corruption. You want to talk about corruption. I mean, they don't hide it in Ukraine, right? And in Russia, they don't hide it. It's just out there. And yet, they're the believers. And they're serving God. And they're happy. And they're trusting God. And God's providing for them. So we need to realize that regardless of what happens in life, God is going to provide for his people. Secondly, notice God's swift and spectacular message of his judgment. His swift and spectacular message of his judgment. Um, and we'll go through this fairly quickly, because we'll come back to the rest of the chapter next week. But first of all, it was damning. It was damning. Notice they're having this party, and all of a sudden, verse 5, suddenly, suddenly, like the ultimate judgment that provided Nebuchadnezzar with time to repent, remember that? Uh, and led to his redemption, this judgment came swift. There's no room for repentance. There might have been earlier, but there's not now. He's going down. That's what I mean by it's damning. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't have a chance to repent because God knows the heart. And that night he's going to die. That night the kingdom is going to be turned over to the Medes and Persians. So, you know, just a little application for us as we quickly walk through some of the characteristics of this. Today's the only day any of us have any guarantee, though. We don't even have a guarantee of the whole day. But the, each day is like that. We only have the guarantee of that day, that minute, whatever. And so it's the day of salvation. If anybody here, by any chance, is unsaved, or anybody listening to this message online, today is the day you must repent. Today is the day you must be saved. And for God's people, today's the day to 
be right with God. And, you know, there, every day goes by where probably at some point in time we're not very right with God. But there might be secret sins that we really need to deal with and we've been putting off. Today is the day to deal with them. Secondly, not only was it damning, it was a direct display from the hand of God. Compare verse 5 with verse 24. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. And then we drop down to verse 24. Then the hand was sent from him, capital H, I am God. And this inscription was written out. This was a direct display from the hand of God. Maybe he used an angel. Doesn't really clarify. It doesn't matter. But either way, it's still from God. But can you imagine this? There have been a, this party, this drunken, you know, festival and party. And I don't know if, if it was on the wall that he's facing or the wall behind him. I looked at some images online and they all have, you know, Nebuchadnezzar doing his thing and the hand comes up behind him and writes these words. Either way, can you imagine that? The glow of the torchlight amidst the sounds of riotous laughter, a hand just appears and starts writing. Imagine how quickly the room got quiet. Because it wasn't quiet before. If you've ever been to a party, you know that, right? And all of a sudden, the king's arrogant confidence is replaced with trembling fear. Which leads me to the third part of God's swift and spectacular message. It was demoralizing and deadly. Verse 6, Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. Now, I've been afraid before, but I've never been that afraid. I mean, we weren't, aren't really told how Belshazzar died. And he didn't die right here, but he dies right after the interpretation, pretty much, of that same evening. I can't help it if he didn't just die from a heart attack. I mean, that's almost what's being described here, but again, it could have been another way, but and here's the thing, in verse 6 what it describes him is his face growing pale and his thoughts alarming him and his hips went slack and his knees began knocking together. He doesn't even know what the words mean yet. He doesn't even know what the message is. All he knows is that a hand is writing this message on the wall and certainly the presence of God and, and just the, the, the reality of probably that this is, you know, something really unusual, and, and he's been mocking God. He's been mocking God, the God of Israel, with his party and with his using the, the um, utensils, the cups and so forth from Jerusalem's temple. He doesn't even know the message yet, and he's literally shaking and about to die. Belshazzar is a perfect example of the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar provided and proclaimed, which Belshazzar refused to obey. God is able to humble those who walk in pride. John Walford says it well when he says, Belshazzar's predicament is another illustration of the insecurity and powerlessness of the rulers of this world when confronted by the power and wisdom of God. God holds in derision the rulers of the world who take counsel against him, Psalm 2, 1 through 4. And like Nebuchadnezzar before him, Belshazzar was soon to experience divine judgment, but without the happy ending. What about you? We're all going to stand before God someday. If our faith is in Christ, which I believe it is for each one of us here, we're going to have a happy ending. But many are not. And if any is hearing this message that, again, it doesn't know Christ, who is your faith resting in? Who is your faith resting in for salvation? And who is our faith resting in in the day-to-day -day life of being provided for and being protected and being able to serve God? It's either in yourself, it's in mankind, it's in government, it might be an empty religion, in human tradition, or it's in the God of the universe. The God who sent His Son to die on the cross our sins, the creator and sustainer of life and of the universe, and the exalter and humbler of all nations and kings. Who is your faith in? Will you live in fear or live by faith? Will you be an instrument of God 
or that God can use to bring about his plans, or are you going to live in fear? Daniel, who never seems to waver in his faith, once again, demonstrates that God is in complete control and that God is going to use him to deliver his message. You know, we may live in uncertain and some might say dark times, but you can be a light like Daniel and trust that God will both use you and provide for you. We haven't gotten through even verse 12 and Apparently, that was my intention until I started preparing the message, because we did finish the message. But let's close with this thought again in our minds. You can trust in self and man and live in fear, or you can trust and serve God and live in faith and enjoy the peace that that faith provides. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we wrestle with the things going on in 